it's good uh, once again to be here in the presence of the Lord. Uh, David said it was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. And I'm, I'm grateful that we're here together as God's people. You know, the devil works overtime to keep us from being together and to try to get us discouraged and defeated and to be alone. But uh, God intends for us to gather together consistently and faithfully and to encourage each other. We're continuing in our series on the parables of Jesus, and uh, today we're going to find ourselves in the same chapter that we were in last week, in Luke chapter 18, and uh, I'm going to be reading verses 9 through 14. This is the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector. Luke chapter 18, verse 9 says this, He also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. Two men went up into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week, I give tithes of all that I get, but the tax collector, standing far off, would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other, for everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. Let's pray and ask the Lord's blessing in this time. Lord, we thank you for your word. Jesus, we thank you for your teaching, and we pray, Lord, that you would minister to us today, Lord, that we would not only hear your words, but we would be changed by them. Lord, we want to be faithful stewards, we want to be people that please you and honor your word. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would guide this time, guide my lips. Jesus, may you be praised, may you be exalted, may you be lifted high this morning. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You know, there's a story of a famous football coach who was on vacation with his family up in Maine. And when they walked into a movie theater and sat down, a handful of people there applauded. And he thought to himself, I can't believe this. People recognize me all the way up here. And then a man came over to him and said, thanks for coming. They won't start the movie without 10 people in here. <laughs> You know, there, there is always the temptation to think of ourselves more highly than we ought to. You know, pride can effectively destroy our relationship with God and with one another. Uh, it, pride can hinder our prayers. You know, spiritual pride happens when we think of ourselves as being more spiritual than what we really are. And spiritual pride is a danger to any of us, particularly those of us maybe that have been walking with Jesus for a long period of time. And so Jesus illustrates that point within this parable. And in verse 9, he makes the point to not trust your own righteousness. He says, he told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. And so Jesus introduces two characters in this parable. Uh, They're going up to the temple to pray. I find it interesting that he mentions they're going up to the temple. As the temple mount there in Jerusalem, people would go to that place. It would be the high ground within the city. And there's a a, a kind of an important metaphor there as we go up to praise the Lord. But we see this first man who is described here as a Pharisee. Now, who were the Pharisees? Well, they were the Jewish religious leaders within Israel. Uh, They were upstanding citizens by and large. Uh, They were well respected by people within that community. Uh, They tried to live very moral lives in keeping with the Old Testament law and many of the traditions that uh, were derived from that law. Uh, And they were models of piety within that community. And so the Pharisees were well respected, people that you would look up to. And, and notice something in verse 11. He says, and, and when the, the Pharisee standing by himself prayed, Thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. Notice that this Pharisee is standing by himself. 
Uh, this is actually a, a characteristic of people who have spiritual pride. They cannot associate with anybody. They want to be kind of unto themselves. We're an entity unto ourselves. You know, we are the elite class. You know, we live in this ivory tower, as it were. We've got the corner on truth. And we've got the corner on righteousness. And so these type of people, these kind of Pharisees, and likewise people with spiritual pride, also act as kind of spiritual policemen and policewomen, always inspecting other people, trying to make sure that they measure up, trying to always accuse people of areas in which they have shortcomings. You know, C.S. Lewis once said, a proud man is always looking down on things and on people. And of course, as long as you're looking down, you can't see something that's above you. And that is true. And that was true of this man who was a Pharisee. He was, always, he was standing by himself and noticing everybody else that was there in the temple to pray. And he distanced himself because he perceived that he was more righteous than everybody else around him. And notice his heart here. Obviously, he's proud, but it says that he justifies himself. He says, basically, I thank you, God, that I'm not like all these other people. He's proud. And this Pharisee seems to actually have a pretty good memory. Look what he says in verse 12. He says, I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. And it's interesting, he, he, he remembers not only the things that he's done himself, tithing and giving and fasting and so forth, but he also has, it remembers all the bad things that other people are doing as well. He mentions adulterers, extortioners, the unjust. So this guy has an amazing memory about what he's doing right and what everybody else is doing wrong. And notice he says that he fasts. It's interesting, in the Old Testament law, it was prescribed annually to only be able to do one fast. At least every Jewish person was the fast on the Day of Atonement. But this man went well above that. He fasted twice every week. Actually, there were, I was looking into some of the traditions in, in the, among the Jews at that time. And the tradition was that many of the Pharisees probably fasted on Mondays and Thursdays. We don't know for sure, but many scholars believe that was their pattern. And they would fast for everybody else's sins. As priests and also as those who were religious leaders, they would pray for the community at large. They would pray for everybody else around them. And so this was something that this man likely did on a regular basis. He went up various days of the week, he fasted and prayed, and he prayed for the sins of the people there in that nation. But he not only fasted from food, but probably from drinking water as well, which is an incredibly significant fast, particularly considering that that was a dry and arid climate there, it is today even as well, that uh, th that was an extremely difficult thing for a person to do, to not only fast from food, but to fast from drink as well. Even though that isn't explicitly mentioned here in the text or what Jesus says, that was something that was a common practice at that time. And so this man fasted. Now, he also mentions that he tithed on a regular basis. In other words, everything that he had and everything that he bought, he tithed on. In other words, this man voluntarily denied himself and gave to God. He not only offered to God himself, but he offered to God his purse. And he was willing to give of his material possessions. Now, I want to be very clear and just pause at this moment. Fasting and tithing are good things. They're not, necessarily, they're not bad things at all, but only when they're done with the right heart, only when they're done with the right motives. And when the motives are pure and when the heart is right out of an overflow of gratitude of what God has done in our lives, it's completely appropriate and at times required of us that we, that we, that we seek the Lord and we fast and we pray and that we give to the Lord's purposes. But as we see here within this parable, there are problems with this man's heart. This Pharisee was proud and he was arrogant. Now the second person that Jesus mentions here in this parable is the tax collector. Now who were tax collectors? Well, they were people who collected taxes for the Roman government and uh, they often cheated people out of money, uh, making up and going well beyond the taxes, and they essentially defrauded the public. And the aim of these tax collectors, by and large, was to try to keep their own personal profits as high as possible. 
If any tax collector was Jewish, uh, they would be seen as a traitor among all the other Jews. They would be hated by them. And notice the fact that this man is praying in the temple, so we assume that this tax collector was also a Jewish man as well. And so he was not an esteem. He was the antithesis of the Pharisee when it came to how people respected. They did not respect this man. They saw him as a cheat. They saw him as a thief. They saw him as somebody they want to get away from. They ostracized him. They hated him because he was getting rich because of his poor practices, because of the way he was conducting himself and collecting those taxes. So this tax collector would have been synonymous with a sinner or with a thief in that society. But notice his position in verse 13. It says, but the tax collector standing far off would not lift up his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast saying, God be merciful to me, a sinner. Notice his, his position. He, again, is standing far off. He's, he's distancing himself for, from the people. Not like the Pharisee who also distanced himself, but that was because of pride. This man distanced himself primarily because he didn't feel that he was worthy to be in there. That he was humble. And the position suggests great humility. God, I can't even come close to you because of my sin. I can't even associate with all the rest of the people here because I feel so guilty of all the things that I've done. He's standing far away, as far away as possible from the Holy of Holies and the holy place. Start, start standing far away as possible from this Pharisee or any of the other people that were there that he wouldn't even lift up his eyes towards heaven. In other words, he's ashamed of himself. He sees himself clearly as a sinner. Notice here that he beats his breast. And that was a practice done by somebody who was in great turmoil. In other words, he's deeply sorrowful for the things that he's done, for the way in which he's conducted himself. He says, Lord, have mercy on me. Actually, that's, that's a quote. He's quoting, whether he knows it or not, from Psalm 51, the introduction there. But he's saying, Lord, have mercy on me. Maybe as a Jewish man, maybe he, maybe he was familiar with the Scriptures growing up. Maybe he had learned that and recognized the law of God, and, and on, but he moved away from it by the way he lived his life. Lord, have mercy on me. Notice that the tax collector wasn't focused on other people, but on himself. He was focused on himself. And this is really the mark of a truly humble person. You know, Romans 12, 3 says, For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself morally more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment. This was a man that thought of, with sober judgment upon himself. No cover-ups, just complete honesty with God. That is what God is looking for. Not trying to hide or give pretense to God or to other people, but to come humbly and to come honestly before God. To be sincere and to speak from our hearts before Him. However, there is an irony in this parable. An irony that would have been shocking to Jesus' original audience when He first shared this story. But look what He says in verse 14. He says, I tell you, this man, speaking of the tax collector, went down to his house justified rather than the other, for everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. The irony is that this sinner, this tax collector, was justified, not the religious Pharisee, not the person that you would expect because of all of his performance and activity from a righteous standpoint. And it's interesting, he used, Jesus uses this language of justified. That's actually a legal term. You think about somebody who's justified, they would be in good legal standing with the courts. But basically what Jesus is saying is that this tax collector stood before God as justified. In other words, his sins were forgiven because he had the right approach. He had the humble heart. He had the honesty before God. And only God can forgive sins, and this man's sins were forgiven. He went home, he returned from that temple justified, whereas the man who justified himself, we assume, did not go home that way. 
But wait, as you examine this, what fault had the Pharisee committed? I mean, after all, he did the right things. And actually, what about this tax collector? For all the people he defrauded, there's no mention here of restitution. I mean, you'd think that. you think about Zacchaeus who made restitution. We don't see any evidence of this man making restitution or giving back the money that he cheated people out of. Yet he's justified here. What Jesus is doing here, I believe, is, is revealing God's perspective regarding the human heart. He's revealing what God is looking for in us. Now, we would presume that this man, if there was a change in his heart, there would be a change in his behavior and action. Following this time, Jesus does not go into that story, but this, Jesus is revealing what God is looking for in each of us. What God is looking for in our hearts. Yes, right actions are very important to God, but they must flow from the right heart. That it's possible to do the right things with the wrong motives and still displease God. And it also makes it clear, as evidence in here, it's possible to pray and still displease God. Think on that for a second. Think on that for a second. Just let that sink in. It's possible to do the right things. It's possible to come here to church, sing the right songs, listen to the sermons, pray, and still not please God. If our hearts stink, if our hearts are filled with pride, if we say, well, God, look at me. I'm, I'm here every Sunday. And I'm, look, I'm grateful, and God's grateful that you come together to join, to not neglect the gathering together of God's people. But if you're using that as a justification of, for God to please you, as if you got your gold star with Him with for the week, and now God owes you as you go out throughout the week, then you're misguided. And worse yet, you're deceived. See, as we look and as we examine this, we're seeing that God is looking for, yes, right actions, but they must flow from a right heart. They must flow from a, a purity of motive. Proverbs 16.5 says, Everyone who is arrogant in heart is an abomination to the Lord. It's an abomination. In other words, God hates arrogance. God can't stand it when people run up on Him acting as if He owes them because of all the good things that they've done in their life. You know, it's interesting that this Pharisee was using religion to hold God at a safe distance. The purpose of religion clearly is to draw us near to God and then to our fellow human beings, but the Pharisee was using religion to hold God at a safe distance and at human beings at a level below. This guy did not understand what it meant to worship God. Even though he had the outward appearance of doing things that were right, inwardly his heart was not right. And so the humble thief was made right with God, not the Bible expert. The humble thief, he, the, the one that had a different heart, the one that had a purity in his approach to God. You know, Matthew 23, 12, Jesus says, whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. James 4, 6 says, God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. God opposes the proud. It's an abomination to come before God arrogantly. My friend, whether in prayer or in anything, God wants us to be humble. Andrew Murray said the chief of all graces is humility, and I have to believe he's right. Incidentally, not, not just incidentally, but very clearly as we look in Philippians, that we're saved because of the humility of Jesus Christ. That he humbled himself even to death, even that death on a cross. The, the salvation is brought to us by the humility of Christ. And so therefore, if we're to be Christ followers, Christians, his disciples, then we need to follow that same pattern. We must follow that same pattern, that pattern of humility. Charles Spurgeon said, The higher a person is in grace, the lower they will be in their own esteem. Humility is to make a right estimation of oneself. He's right. That we remember from where God has brought us from, how God had delivered us from the muck and the mire of life, how He set our feet on the rock, and we always need to have a perspective that we are redeemed 
And therefore, we should not look down on other people, other neighbors and family members, because friends, if it had not been for the sheer grace of God, the devil would have had every last one of us. You know, we've been talking about prayer this month. In the lesson last week that we learned that God wants us to be persistent in our prayers, to be tenacious in, in our, our seeking of God and our asking of Him, and to believe that when we ask according to His will, that He will answer us rightly in His own good time. But, you know, as we look at this parable, it's interesting that these parables are set right next to each other in Luke's gospel, but we, we learn today that God wants us to approach Him with the right heart. That it's not just repeatedly at coming before Him as much as we need to be tenacious in our prayers, but being tenacious with the right heart. Having the right heart in our approach. Not with arrogant pride. I deserve this, God. Look at all I've done. And we may not say that. But if we were to strip back the layers subconsciously, God, after all these years I've been serving you, you owe me. We may not say that, but deep in the caverns of our souls, we may believe that. No, God doesn't want us to approach Him with arrogant pride, but with humility. Say, God, I don't deserve anything of your mercy and your grace, God, but God, in your kindness, would you be merciful to me? Would you be merciful to my friend or my family member? Friends, nothing will hinder our prayers more significantly than spiritual pride. Let me say that again. Nothing will hinder our prayers more significantly than spiritual pride. God opposes the proud, but He gives grace to the humble. And I'm not just talking about praying humbly. I'm also talking about living humbly. So, so many times we say this, okay, I just need to pray humbly, and we go the rest of the week, and we're barking out orders to everybody else and honking the car in front. Every, every place we go, we're always, you know, we're the leader. And yes, lead, it's important as leaders to, to, to be godly, but to lead means to serve and to care and to shepherd people. Yes, there are times when we, we maybe give orders to people that, that work under us or, or our kids or whatnot, but we need to have a humble heart. We're not just talking about praying humbly here as much as that is included. What God is looking for in us is a lifestyle of humility. Now, there isn't time, there may be times for boldness and, and that we go forth and we advance with that boldness and, and, and confidence that God has given us, but yet it also must be marked with a humble disposition that we need to cultivate a disposition of gratefulness to God and a love for other people, to not use people for our own ends, but to love them. That we need to see ourselves for who we really are apart from God's grace, that we're terrible sinners. And you know, the truth is, people who truly know how to approach God can truly see themselves. You know, true worship of God should make us humble. For it's in humility that we are more apt to love God and love other people. And perhaps maybe our lack of love towards other people reveals pride in our hearts. The question that we need to ask ourselves as we think on this parable this morning is, which character best represents you? The Pharisee or the tax collector? You know, it's interesting, Jesus' aim in this parable when he's telling it was to stir the conscience of the Pharisees. Now, they were likely part of that original audience when Jesus first heard this. And so, you know, they were the ones that were probably pricked the most from this because they were the ones that were esteemed in the community. And Jesus is hitting them right between the eyes. He's saying, look, your arrogance stinks. He was pricking their conscience, and perhaps the Holy Spirit is pricking some of our consciences here this morning. Oh yes, we know we've sinned, but compared to other people, I haven't sinned too bad. And that's the problem. We compare ourselves with other people. We try to measure ourselves up, not according to the perfection of God and His holiness, but according to the shortcomings of other people. 
Are you focused on the shortcomings of other people? Or are you looking at your own heart this morning? You know, you, you can't make the case for loving God when you hate your brother or sister. In that regard, like this Pharisee, uh, you may be in big trouble this morning because it's possible to shut yourself out of the grace of God. It's possible to shut yourself out of the grace of God. Pride does it. Pride does it. You know, what's really sad is that the Pharisee thought that he had the right perspective about other people. But in, in essence, he was misjudging them. Because God accepted the prayer of this tax collector. The Pharisee missed it even in his own judgments. You know, I, I had a former professor, Ellsworth Callis at Asbury Seminary. He said, the root problem for good people is not simply that they have a holier-than-thou attitude. It's that they are possessed by a holier-than-God attitude. They condemn in judgment those in whom God does not. The heart of the matter isn't that God doesn't like good people. It's that good people don't like God. Is it possible for you and I to misjudge people? You and me? It's possible. Could it be possible that we do it regularly? Ooh. God, help me to see people with your eyes. Help me to have your heart. Maybe today you're admirably, admirably religious. Then God maybe is inviting you to consider, to ponder, to chew on this very parable to take it to heart, to think on it. Maybe God is challenging you and me today to first of all climb down the stairs of our ivory towers and to stand with everybody else. Maybe secondly, God is inviting us to take off our spiritual policeman as policewoman badge. <laughs> Feeling like it's our job to be Holy Spirit for everybody else. Number three, it's time that we come humbly to the foot of the cross and ask Jesus for mercy. You know, one of the oldest prayers in church history is the Greek word Kyrie eleison. It means, Lord, have mercy. It's a simple yet profound prayer that's been prayed for centuries. But how often do we need to pray it? Lord, have mercy on me. You know, if we want our prayers to be powerful, if we want God to listen to our needs and our requests, then we need to have the disposition of humility that we need to have the, the disposition that it's not that I know what's best, God, here, but you know what's best. And the lesson that Jesus reveals to us in this parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector is that God condemns self-righteousness and he commends humility. You know, G.K. Chesterton said it this way. He said, no one is really any good until he knows how bad he is or he might be till he squeezed out of his soul the last drop of the oil of the Pharisees. I want to just invite you to stand your feet. We're going to close with a prayer together. And I'm going to ask you to repeat these words. You know, I think it's important that we confess before God our need for him. You know, repentance isn't just something we do when we first come to Christ. Repentance is a lifelong task. I want to say... Let's be experts in repentance. But I'm going to just invite you now, if you would just bow your heads, I would just ask you to put your hand over your heart this morning. And we're going to just confess these words to me. I'm going to say a word, and you, you can just repeat right after me, but we're just going to confess our need for God. Repeat after me. Oh God, I come to you humbly, and I ask for your mercy for me. I confess my sin to you. I confess pride. I confess a judgmental spirit. I confess bitterness and unforgiveness. 
Lord, have mercy on me. I trust what Christ has done for me on the cross. I ask that his blood would cover my sins. Change me. Transform me by your grace. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's sing together.